For context, I'm a girl. When I was 12, my parents went away for a week to visit family in a different country. They had originally arranged for me to join them, but I begged and begged for them to let me stay here at home. I hated visiting family overseas. Because my older brother, 17, was staying home, they decided in the end to let me stay with him. The first few nights, everything was fine. It was summer break, so I didn't have school, and there was a ton of food in the house. So we just ate, played video games, and watched a lot of TV. This was the first time in my life that I was separated from my parents for more than a couple of days. And for the most part, I was totally and completely in the zone. My brother was very lenient as well. He let me eat whatever I wanted, and stay up super late without telling me to sleep. Partially because he was a kid himself, and partially because we'd always gotten along. In any case, he was still the one in charge. One night, the fourth one if I remember correctly, my brother decided to order a pizza. The food in the house wasn't running out, but my parents had left us with a bit of extra cash, and we hadn't spent any of it yet, so we figured a pizza was in order. He phoned it in at around 8 o'clock in the evening, and we sat in the living room watching a movie while we were waiting. Thus far, he had avoided going out with his friends, because he was afraid of leaving me home alone. So that night, he invited a couple of friends over to join us. Drew and Chance. The four of us were hanging out together and chilling, when suddenly there was a knock at the door. Thinking it was the pizza delivery person, my brother got up to answer it. He ran down the stairs with some cash and nearly unlocked it when Drew quickly shouted, Hold on. In the living room with Chance, I glanced to the front of the house where Drew was standing through the upstairs window. He was looking at something outside on the driveway. I went over to see if something was wrong, and I noticed that there was no car parked in the driveway, nor were there any cars parked along the curb, just my brother's car and our neighbor's car in the distance. My brother came halfway up the stairs to ask what was wrong, and then Drew told him about the car situation, after which my brother said he hadn't invited anyone else to the house. In fact... No one else knew we were home alone that week. Just his two best friends, both of whom were huge dorks and definitely not the type to spread word of a party or anything else. I hadn't told anyone either. We all stood upstairs together, periodically looking through the window until the person who had knocked stepped away from the front door and into our line of sight. The lights in the front of the house were off and the blinds were closed so this person couldn't see us. We could, however, see them. Surprisingly, there were two of them, both men. They were on the taller side, and the lower halves of their faces were covered by their jacket collars. Additionally, they were dressed entirely in black. Right away, something felt off. My brother ordered me to wait in the living room. Before that, he had never used that tone with me. I would normally have felt inclined to disobey him, but I could tell by the shakiness in his voice that he wasn't joking around. I promptly stepped away from the window and walked away as my brother and his friends began whispering to each other, debating on what to do. I caught some of it. It seemed the people in the driveway wouldn't go away. They just stood there, waiting. Then one of them approached the door again while the other looked on, and there was another knock. I remember jumping in my skin when I heard it, quickly running to my brother's side. This time, he didn't tell me to go away. Chance suggested answering the door to see what the men wanted, but Drew was firmly against it. Without saying the words out loud, presumably to keep from scaring me, he expressed concern, implying those men meant to harm us in some way. My brother was somewhere in the middle. There was debate in his eyes. For a moment, he appeared to lean more towards Chance's side, but he quickly teetered to the other, taking us all to the living room where we waited it out. We still had no idea if the pizza delivery person would come, and what would happen to them if they did. Regardless, we waited, hoping our fear was for nothing. 
and that time there were a few more knocks at the door. All of them resembled the earlier ones, so we knew it was still those same men. They grew louder every time too, louder and harder, as if they were growing impatient. When we heard footsteps coming up the sun deck, we panicked and shut off all the TV, as well as every light in the room. I remember sitting between my brother and Drew while Chance went to the kitchen to grab the phone. Worst comes to worst, we decided we would call the police. If it was a prank, at least we would know. We all knew at this point, though, that it wasn't a prank. This lasted for a good 30 minutes. Continuous knocks, and even a voice asking, Seen a dog lost recently? We were all well versed in slasher fix, and we all knew the whole have you seen my dog thing was a major red flag, so we never said anything in response. We made it seem like no one was home, which eventually deterred these men. A short while later, the knocks and questions about their lost dog came to an end. My brother went over to the front window to check, confirming that the men were gone. Still, we were reluctant to let our guard down. It was ten minutes later when there was another knock, the actual pizza delivery person this time, that we relaxed. Both my brother and Chance went down together to answer the door, paid the pizza delivery guy, and came back up with the two mediums we had ordered. Slowly, we grew less anxious, and we ate. Eventually, we laughed at how scared we were. We convinced ourselves that we had overreacted big time, and even went so far as watching a scary movie after. A few days later, when my parents were on their way back, my mother called us from the airport. She sounded panicked and asked if we were okay. My brother assured her that we were both fine, and we asked why she was so strung out. She quickly told us that three tenants who were renting a house a few blocks away from ours were terrorized and left for dead a couple of nights ago. She said the news reports said it was because they answered their door when a pair of strange men came knocking. A few years ago, it was my boyfriend's birthday, and I went to surprise him at work. We weren't supposed to see each other until the weekend afterwards, because we were both working night shifts and we'd be too tired for celebrations. But luckily, I managed to get off early, so I decided to surprise him. So, dressed in my tightest dress and some nice lingerie underneath, I got my ass on the next bus to see him. I decided to get the later bus, as the earlier one would have taken me to the petrol station nearby, and would mean I'd have to walk a short way in the dark. Funnily enough, I thought I was being smart and looking after my safety by doing this. The later bus would stop just in front of the car park just across from his work, where his car would be, so I'd be able to wait under the lights for a maximum of 15 minutes for him to come out. Solid plan, I thought. At the bus stop, I noticed a man sitting by himself at the end of the bench, giggling. My city has a pretty bad meth problem, so although this isn't ideal, this isn't exactly unusual. I just stood as close as possible to the road on the opposite end of the seat from the dude who was grinning to himself, while I texted my friend to ease my fear. She was joking around, asking me to take a picture of the guy just in case, when I felt a wave of nausea strong enough to look up. He had moved to the other end of the seat, as close as possible to me without getting up. He was grinning. It was a horrifying expression. Mouth stretched unnaturally wide, showing his crooked, yellowing teeth. His face was pockmarked, and his cheeks were sallow. Clearly a user. I didn't know what to do, so I just swallowed and said, Hi. Hello, princess. Now I'm used to getting a lot of unwanted, creepy attention. Not because I'm devastatingly attractive, but because I'm a relatively slim Asian woman just under six feet, which makes me a target for creepers with yellow fever. I've been told countless obscene and racist things by total strangers, but I've never had someone raise the hairs on the back of my neck like this guy did. You're a tight little thing, aren't you? 
I gotta get me some of that. Asians are good with their little hands. His tone was soft, and he didn't raise his voice, as if he was telling me a secret. Just as I was about to text my best friend to ask her to please pick me up, the bus arrived and I leapt onto it. My heart sank when I saw the front seat closest to the bus driver was occupied, and I was forced to stand. The creepy meth man, of course, stood right next to me, breathing down my neck. I prayed he'd get off before me. But of course, he didn't. As we were getting closer and closer to my stop, I began to feel the overwhelming sense of panic. I felt nauseous with fear. I knew the car park near my boyfriend's work was a few meters away from a car wash, but it was also next to a dark undercover area near a funeral home that I knew was a druggy hotspot. My best bet, I figured, was to jump off the bus as soon as possible and hastily wake my way to the car wash and ask for help. I jumped off the bus, ran straight across the road to the car park, and my stomach dropped when I realized it was closed. Of course, it was late night. How could I be so stupid? I looked behind me to see if he'd followed me, and he was walking slowly towards me, still smiling that freakish smile, and then slowly started circling the car park. I realized that he was walking in spirals, so with each circle, he was getting closer and closer towards me. I had tears streaming down my face, and had absolutely no weapons on me. It didn't even occur to me to call for help, because I didn't want to look away from this stranger. I was absolutely frozen in fear. And then just by pure, incredible luck, a car pulled up to the car park. It was a group of teenage bogans, basically frat boys, who even through their own drunkenness, recognized a terrified and hysterical woman in trouble. I screamed at them for help, and they wasted no time, making a beeline straight for the creepy guy. The dude ran as soon as he saw him approaching in their car, while the other blokes comforted me and called the police. My boyfriend showed up shortly afterwards, concerned and confused why his scantily clad, sobbing girlfriend was in the car park, being consoled by four random teenagers. He thanked them, and to this day, I don't know what I would have done if they hadn't showed up. Throughout my entire childhood, my NPD-slash-BPD parents consistently put me in harm's way, as nothing mattered more to them than partying or fighting. I was always being exposed to creepy, ill-intentioned men who happened to be a contact of some kind, so I was stuck dealing with them until they moved on to the next phase of their party days. Reed switched drugs. This is only one of many stories I ha- This is only one of many stories I have where I was in the process of being targeted. In early middle school, I was a bit of a loner due to many insecurities, which put me in a position to be an easy target. From several forms of neglect, carrying extra weight at the time, and the fact that my parents weren't providing me with proper clothing, which led me to being teased, I was so starved for positive attention, yet too timid to speak up. I was in advanced classes, which met for lessons in a dimly lit trailer behind the school. We were a tight-knit group because we were special. I had never felt special before, so the AG group and the bond I shared with children who otherwise wouldn't pay me any attention due to the huge gap in our socioeconomic status meant a lot to me. One student in particular intrigued me. He had the softest blue eyes and hair so blonde it was white. He was witty and kind-hearted. Everyone adored him, yet he had the same apprehension as I, and seemed just as awkward and shy as I did, though he put up a good front. I'd often wonder what his life was like at home. Was he kind because he was treated well? Was he shy because he wasn't? I'd soon get an idea of what life was like for Charlie, but wouldn't grasp the gravity of my findings until years later. Our local baseball stadium was hosting a variety show, as they did annually, and being my parents weren't available for such things, 
I tagged along with my older teenage sister. She was with her boyfriend at the time, and feeling like a third wheel, I would scan the crowd, people watching to distract myself from their gratuitous public displays of entirely too much affection for teens. I'd see dads holding their little kids on their shoulders, moms cradling their youngsters while waiting for the next set to start, and I was envious. While scanning the crowd, I saw Charlie from a distance. They had a spot on the stands, while we were stuck sitting on the ground in the outfield, so I said I was going to the bathroom and made my way over to them. I was happy to see someone I knew who might actually want to interact with me. It's lonely being the unwanted third wheel. He introduced me to his dad. He had the same blue eyes and kind smile. He welcomed me quite literally with open arms, and immediately, and without question, tucked me under his arm onto the bleacher between him and his son. At first, with childlike wonder, I accepted his attention and probing questions. This was an adult who was interested in me, how my day went, how school was going. Wait, why does he need to know where I live? Why hasn't he let go of my hand? Why is Charlie squirming with discomfort? I felt faint. My ears were burning with anxiety, and I was suddenly hyper-aware of his touch. The scenery around us was blurred, sounds muffled. At that moment, I realized I had made a mistake. I tried to make excuses to go back to my seat, but he protested. I tried to let go of his hand, but he'd only squeeze his arm around me tighter and kiss my cheek. My eyes searched the crowd for my sister, and she finally came looking for me after what seemed like an eternity. I was relieved. I felt like she had saved me without even knowing it. After a while, I almost forgot about Charlie's dad, until the day my parents returned from a trip to the corner store with him in their car. Apparently, they'd bumped into him at the store, introduced himself, got to chatting, and offered to help them with renovating our house. That was an instant in for him, and my parents were overjoyed at the unusual kindness of this seemingly random stranger, rather than recognizing it as an absurd concept as I had. What a coincidence, right? He exited the car in my driveway, and introduced himself as though we had never met. For weeks, he worked diligently on our home, free of charge, all the while engaging me any chance he had. I let my guard down after a while, because I assumed, like any child would, that if there were any danger, my parents would sense it, and protect me from it. Over time, he won me over, teaching me about the solar system as he worked on insulation, teaching me French words for household objects while he hung sliding. I trusted that, being as my parents were working alongside him. I trusted that they'd put a stop to any inappropriate attention. I was wrong. They were oblivious, blinded by his charm and kindness. He eventually started stopping by when my parents weren't home. Though it was clear they were gone as soon as you turned into our driveway, he would linger, longer each time, alternating between knocking on the door and then waiting in his car to see if the blinds moved. My heart pounded every time. He caught me outside alone by chance on one of these occasions, and lured me over with a gift he had promised me weeks before. Upon accepting, I tried my best to get away from him and hurry into the house. I knew my parents wouldn't be home until the wee hours, so I was careful not to behave in a way that would make him aware that I was in on his attentions. I was terrified how he would react if he could tell. Due to years of abuse and neglect, I was always in a state of hypervigilance, so I did my best to make excuses while he held tight to my hand and pled with me to finish our important talk about our special relationship and how much more he cared about me than my family did. Typical grooming tactics, only I sensed a desperation in his pleading and knew that if I didn't get away immediately, I would be harmed. I ran back inside and my sister helped me barricade all the entryways. He lingered on the property for an hour, alternating between paving the porch, knocking, 
looking in windows, whistling a tune, or pressing his face against the door and softly calling my name. I was keenly aware that if I didn't force my parents to take action, I would soon be a victim. As I suspected, they came home in the middle of the night, too drunk to confront, and when I finally did, they laughed off the notion that he was dangerous. I blocked out a huge chunk of time following that, and remained bitter about the whole ordeal for some time. I don't remember ever seeing him again, but asking my parents now, they have no idea what I'm talking about. In recent years, I reconnected with Charlie through social media and invited him out with our group. By the end of the night, I had had a few, and for some reason, casually joked to him that his dad creeped me out. He immediately tensed up, stuttered nervously. Uh, yeah, uh, he, he was an odd guy. I tried to discreetly ask questions to get more info on this man. I wanted to Google his name, look for him on the sex offender registry, anything to bring me some closure. But I wasn't able to get anything out of him. I could tell, though, by the way he acted, that he was holding back something sinister. His time with us soon came to a close, and I never saw or heard from him again. To this day, I wonder what Charlie knew. I wondered if that's why his parents were divorced. To this day, I'm hypervigilant in the presence of the opposite sex. My daughter is rarely allowed out of my sight. No one is allowed to get too close to her without my having investigated them to some degree, and I have far too many talks with her about the dangers that lurk beyond our front door. I couldn't live with myself if I made the same mistakes as my parents. So my advice to all parents, be aware of your child's surroundings at all times. Be observant. Pay close attention to anyone paying close attention to them, and always watch for the warning signs. Never ignore even the tiniest red flag, because if you do, they could easily become prey. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here as always. I just wanted to thank you guys so much, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you guys enjoyed the video, please feel free to leave some feedback in the comments below, or perhaps like, share, or subscribe if you feel so inclined. For a small update, the next Q&A is going to be coming up this weekend, so if you have any questions that you'd like to have answered in that video, please feel free to leave your questions in the comments of this video right here, and I'll try to include them if I get the chance. If you guys have any personal stories that you'd like to share, or if you'd just like to chat, go ahead and take a look in the description. In the description below the video, you can find links to all of my social media accounts, including my Facebook, Twitter, and Gmail. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to include your story in a video or respond as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please feel free to include in the tagline what the name of the story is, what the theme is if it has any, and how you would like to be credited in the description of the video that story appears in. If you're ever curious about the music used in my videos, that is also listed in the description. I list the tracks used in the video by name, in the order which they appear, and I also have links to the artists if you enjoy the music and you'd like to check out more of their work. So if you're ever curious about the music, just go ahead and check down there in the description below. Last but not least, if you guys have any constructive criticism, please feel free to leave it in the comments below, as I'm always looking for new ways to improve the channel. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day.